Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I'm going to do a video talking about the cartridge magazine control regulations and some of the unusual edge cases and corner cases because I did a video a little bit ago and people said, hey, can you do a bit of a deeper dive into this? Can you look at, you know, this case or that case where there's sort of unusual scenarios that come up? So I'll start out by talking about the regulations themselves, and then we'll start getting into places where those regulations start to break down because they're very badly written regulations. They didn't really contemplate a lot of things. And quite frankly, I think the best outcome would be to just strike them out entirely. But uh, let's dive into the regulations themselves. So sometimes this says former cartridge magazine control regulations. Sometimes people say, oh, it says former. So that means it's not in effect. And that's not the case. Um, this was just the regulation that was used to add this to the list of prohibited uh, things. So this is still very much the law as it stands. So any cartridge magazine. Now, cartridge magazine is important here because you may have some things that are sort of magazine-like, which are not cartridge magazines. So for example, uh, this is an airsoft magazine. It does not take cartridges. It takes airsoft pellets, which of course are not cartridges. They may count as ammunition in certain other areas, but they are not cartridges. So this is not a cartridge magazine and therefore doesn't uh, get covered, which means that this thing can have a fairly substantial capacity. Now, uh, so when we're talking about cartridge magazines, uh, A, that is capable of containing more than five cartridges of the type for which the magazine was originally designed and that is designed or manufactured for use in. So the originally designed here is a key bit of language because what this sort of says or what this aims to do is to try to prevent the magazine from kind of jumping categories. So what that means is that if you've got a magazine that's legal for use in one gun, it's legal for use in any gun. It's not the case that if you take that magazine and insert it into a different firearm, that suddenly it becomes a prohibited magazine. It should be that it's either a prohibited device and illegal or not a prohibited device and therefore legal no matter what. So, and that is designed or manufactured for use in... Uh, a, a semi-automatic handgun that is not commonly available in Canada. So what does not commonly available in Canada mean? I don't really know because there's not actually case law that covers this that I've been able to find. Um, there's no sort of firm definition for this, which is very common. They seem to be avoiding definitions that kind of pin things down. Um, certainly, you know, some things, for instance, the Tokarev pistol, there's tons of those in Canada. So that would certainly be an example of something that is commonly available in Canada. But if we think of something that's not commonly available, you might have something, for instance, a firearm designer builds one, you know, there's a one-of-a-kind unique handgun. Uh, that would probably be an example of not commonly available. In the middle, there's this giant range of, we don't know, you know, so that's uh, unclear. A semi-automatic firearm other than a semi-automatic handgun. So this is the general category of semi-automatic rifles and semi-automatic shotguns get capped at five. Unless they fall into some other exception and we'll have a look at some of those. An automatic firearm, whether or not it has been altered to discharge only one projectile with one pressure of the trigger. Now let's look at the language here just, you know, as we evaluate this law and sort of consider things. So, that is capable of containing more than five cartridges of the type for which the magazine was originally designed and that is designed or manufactured for use in an automatic firearm. You know, so when we get to the topic of the original firearm that it's designed for, the language here gets very strange because the altered to discharge only one projectile wouldn't matter either way because the underlying gun would be an automatic firearm. I don't understand why this particular language was chosen other than just bad drafting and kind of a a mental failure as they were, you know, as they were drafting this. This is really, it's clumsy. It's kind of self-contradictory as to what they're trying to say here. 
So I have some concerns with uh, with this particular bit of language. And then they go on to say, the firearms, the designs commonly known as the Ingram M10 and M11 pistols, uh, commonly known as the Mac 10, which would be covered under the automatic firearm aspect. So again, a mm, little bit of an unusual thing there. Uh, partisan Avenger auto pistol and the Uzi pistol, including the micro Uzi pistol. Again, we've got a bit of an issue there in terms of why did they bother including four, five, and six? But however, they also say any cartridge magazine that is capable of containing more than 10 cartridges of the type for which the magazine was originally designed and that is designed or manufactured for use in a semi-automatic handgun that is commonly available in Canada. So if you have a semi-automatic handgun that is commonly available in Canada, the magazine limit goes up to 10 rather than 5. So we've got this 5 uh, limit for some, 10 limit for some things, and some things are unlimited. And they'll give us some examples of that. Paragraph 1A does not include any cartridge magazine that A was originally designed or manufactured for use in a firearm that is chambered or designed for uh, to use rim fire cartridges. Now that's 1A, which just applies to the semi-automatic handguns not commonly available in Canada and semi-automatic firearms other than a semi-automatic handgun, but doesn't apply to 1B, which is handguns uh, that are commonly available in Canada. This creates a really unusual circumstance where a rim fire handgun uh, that is not commonly available in Canada could have a magazine limit of unlimited and then once it becomes commonly available in Canada could suddenly jump down to needing to be limited to 10. But again, good good drafting, good sort of intelligent legal design here is not something you should expect to see. So this kind of problem is going to come up not just this time, but we're going to see more examples of it. A is a rifle of the type commonly known as the Lee Enfield rifle, where the magazine is capable of containing not more than 10 cartridges of the type for which the magazine was originally designed. Uh, so if you spot the problem here, Lee Enfield is not a semi-automatic rifle, and so it's not limited. And is more commonly known as the M1 Garand. So M1 Garand is accepted here. Now, if you just spotted a cut, that's because there's a whole bunch of exceptions for sort of historical firearms, you know, Charlton rifle, uh, Lewis guns. I originally went through that and it took about 10 minutes that you wouldn't get back from your life. If you're curious about a certain specific historical firearm, go to the, uh, the regulations, but I'm not going to go through all that here because again, 10 minutes, you wouldn't get back from your life. However, there are some other provisions we should look at. So for a cartridge magazine described in subsection one that has been altered or remanufactured, so it is not capable of containing more than five or 10 cartridges, as the case may be, of the type for which it is originally designed is not a prohibited device as prescribed by that subsection, if the modification to the magazine cannot be easily removed and the magazine cannot be easily further altered, so it is capable of containing more than five or 10 cartridges, as the case may be. So the reason for that is basically that uh, a lot of magazines are not designed to the Canadian specifications. They're designed instead to sort of what fits easily into the gun, what, uh, what makes sense. Uh, often they sort of extend the magazine to the, to the end of the grip and sort of that standard capacity, whatever that happens to be, which might be, you know, 18 rounds. So as Canadians, we're not a big enough market to sort of dictate to the world, hey, make magazines to our standards. What that ends up meaning is that uh, most of the magazines sort of floating around, or many of them have been modified. And so this is the section that allows for a modification of these magazines such that they can still be used. Uh, when you think about rifles like the SKS, which has an internal magazine, um, you know, they're not making new SKSs. They're all, at least not to my knowledge, they're all sort of surplus historical SKSs. So, you know, people are modifying the magazines on those so that they hold five rounds instead of the original 10. And 
that's you know allowed for by this section. They also provide some examples of uh, altering or remanufacturing, which includes indentation of its casing by forging, casting, swaging, or impressing. So if you you know dent it in. In the case of a cartridge magazine with a steel or aluminum casing, the insertion and attachment of a plug, sleeve, rod, pin, flange, or similar device made of steel or aluminum, as the case may be, or of a similar material to the inner surface of its casing by welding, brazing, or any similar method, or in the case of a cartridge magazine with a casing made of a material other than steel or aluminum, the attachment of a plug, sleeve, rod, pins, flange, or similar device made of steel or a material similar to the that of the magazine casing to the inner surface of its casing by welding, brazing, or any other similar method, or by applying a permanent adhesive substance such as a cement or an epoxy or other glue. Note that this is examples of ways that would count, but it's not an exhaustive list. So for example, I have seen uh, cartridge magazines where they've cut a hole in the side, such that if you put uh, an additional cartridge in, they start falling out. Uh, while that's not sort of provided for as an you know one of the examples it would certainly seem to qualify um it's not clear that you necessarily have to go as far as is specified in a b or c to qualify this is an unusual area of law it's very poorly uh, phrased here uh, because it leaves open the possibility that it might allow for other sort of methods of doing it and there's not really a whole lot of guidance but if you follow these these steps then it's going to be very difficult for them to uh to argue that your cartridge magazine has not been properly modified all right so you know the general rule is you know for handguns uh 10 rounds if it's a semi-automatic handgun or five rounds if it's a semi-automatic rifle and then you know we have rimfire cartridges so rimfire rifles are unlimited as are non-semi-automatic rifles so or the unusual case of non-semi-automatic handguns well revolving actions although they rarely exceed 10 but uh so bolt action rifles for instance don't have a limit uh similarly you know rimfire rifles typically don't have a limit but let's get into some unusual corner cases, and there's a whole bunch of them that we can consider. Let's have a look at what the RCMP has to say, because the RCMP has all sorts of opinions on this, and we can uh, sort of break those down. All right, so uh, this is available online. I'll link to this uh, as well as to the regulations just so that you can follow it up. They give you the general rule about the maximum capacity that I just gave you. But then they start getting into some exceptions. And these exceptions are typically not something that you can find in case law or anything like that. These are RCMP interpretations. And so a court is potentially going to interpret them differently or they might interpret them in line with the RCMP's views. But as a general rule, you should follow the RCMP's interpretation because doing otherwise risks arrest. And even if you end up winning in court, it's going to be incredibly expensive. So we're kind of stuck with the RCMP interpretation unless you happen to be willing to risk jail and huge amounts of money in order to potentially contest it. So I don't recommend that. And I think that, frankly, you'd be crazy to do it. But if that is something you're thinking of doing, talk to a lawyer first. Because A, they might talk you out of it. And B, if you're not inclined to be talked out of it, they can at least tell you how to go about that in a way that minimizes your risk. And that uh, minimizes your, uh, or that maximizes your chance of winning. So, magazines designed or manufactured for both rimfire-capable rifles or caliber rifles and handguns. So they say, if it's designed to contain rimfire cartridges and manufactured uh, for a rifle, no regulated capacity. If for a handgun, limited to 10 cartridges. And they say, if designed or manufactured for use in both rifles and semi-automatic handguns, subject to the handgun limit of 10 cartridges. 
And so they give the example of the Smith and Wesson M&P 1522 and 1522 pistol, uh, chambered for 22 rimfire, as well as the Ruger BX25 magazine, uh, chambered for 22 uh, rimfire, and they note the 22 charger handgun. So they say that that's uh, limited to 10. And I'm just going to switch this over so that you've got maybe a bigger view here. All right, hopefully that's a little easier to read. So uh, now this is interesting and subject to some interpretation because the, the Charger handgun is actually a fairly recent thing on the market. And there's not a whole lot of them in Canada. So there's some issue there. But... The RCMP have taken the view that, for instance, uh, drum magazines made for the Ruger 10-22 uh, family of rifles are prohibited even where, you know, because they say it's designed for use in the 22 Charger handgun. But they say that even in cases where the actual magazine was built before the Charger handgun existed. And it seems to me to be a very difficult interpretation to say that this magazine was designed and manufactured for use in the 22 Charger handgun if it predates the 22 Charger handgun. Are we assuming that, you know, the designers of those magazines had a time machine or that they could see the future? I mean, if so, you know, if you can see the future, I don't recommend that you get into the firearm magazine designing market you know buy lottery tickets instead so but uh so whether or not it makes sense you should expect that if you have a cartridge magazine for the 1022 that can contain more than 10 uh, cartridges that the police may charge you and a court may end up agreeing with them so it's not worth the risk don't do it continuing on here uh, magazines designed or manufactured for both center fire caliber semi-automatic rifle and other non-semi-automatic rifles. So they're saying if it can, uh, if it's designed for use in both, that it's going to be limited to five. And they give the example of the Remington Model 7615 pump action rifle for 223 Remington. They say the 10 round magazine is prohibited. The five round magazine is unregulated. Now, they're going to interpret, you know, designed or manufactured for use as basically, can it be used with? So that uh, tells us another sort of interpretation here. Magazines designed for one firearm, but used in a different firearm. So there are some situations where magazines can be built for one particular gun, but might fit and feed in another gun. They say the maximum permitted capacity of a magazine is determined by the kind of firearm it is designed or manufactured for use in, and not the kind of firearm it might actually be used in. This means the maximum permitted capacity remains the same regardless of which firearm it might be used in. So again, we see that thing where it doesn't change status depending on which gun you're actually using, or which guns you own, or even which licenses you have. Uh, so if there's a handgun legal version of something, you don't need a restricted license. You don't need a restricted license to possess a you know, legal handgun magazine. In fact, you don't need a firearms license at all to possess a firearm magazine. So they give some examples here. The model uh, or the Marlin Model 45 uh, rifle chambered for 45 auto center fire caliber uses magazines designed and manufactured for the Colt 1911 handgun. Therefore, the seven round and eight round capacities are permitted. And in fact, a 10 round capacity would be permitted if it was designed for the 1911. Example two, the Ruger PC carbine chambered for nine millimeter Luger center fire cartridges uses magazines designed and manufactured for Glock and Ruger SR series handguns. Therefore, the 10 round capacities are permitted. Now, let's just jump from here. This is the uh, the page that's currently available on their website, but I wanna jump to a bulletin that they put out not long ago. And because I think it's an interesting example of kind of changes in RCMP interpretation. So this is from the bulletin that went out uh, not too long ago on the same topic. And that bulletin includes this language that has been removed from the web page. 
It says, a similar example is the 10-round capacity magazine for the Rock River Arms LAR-15 pistol, regardless of the kind of firearm it is actually used in. So, from the deletion of this, it seems that the RCMP may have decided to change their views on that. Uh, that means that the LAR-15 magazines right now are in kind of a state of potential limbo as to what kind of peril you're in. But the law didn't actually change. Just the RCMP decided they didn't really want to, you know, include that on their webpage anymore for some reason. So that's kind of an interesting uh, little wrinkle there. People ask me, you know, is the LAR-15 magazine legal? Um, the RCMP certainly thought so at one point. They seem to be backpedaling from that now. And I can't say for certain what a court would or would not do with regards to an LAR-15 magazine. I personally think that, you know, the proper interpretation would be that they're legal. But, you know, that's just my best guess. A court could very well go the other way on that. This is, you know, don't take that as legal advice. Take that as, you know, this is my thoughts on the subject. But the LAR-15 magazines do have some legal risk to them. You can make your own decisions. You should talk to a lawyer, you know, if this is something you own or something you're considering or whatever else. So just be aware that the RCMP has changed their views on that one. And that's a fairly significant little change. All right, so there's another fun category here, which is magazines for semi-automatic handguns, which contain more than 10 rounds of a different caliber. So the example they give is the H&K P7. Um, I'll give the example of the SIG P226, because I have one of those. Uh, there's a 40 caliber variant, and if you have the cartridge magazine for the 40 caliber uh, variant, it can hold 13 9mm cartridges and it'll still feed so that's legal the rcmp note this on their web page but again they could change their mind you know as of tomorrow as of in between when i hit stop and before i manage to hit upload so as we've seen they've already apparently changed their mind with respect to the lar 15 magazine they could change their mind on this but i think that to do so on this particular one would require a fairly tortured interpretation of the law but yeah, they note here that uh, this is allowed as the maximum permitted capacity of the 40 Smith & Wesson centerfire caliber magazine is measured by the number of 40 Smith & Wesson centerfire uh, caliber cartridges it is capable of holding, 10 in the case of the HKP-7 pistol magazine. Now note that they specify semi-automatic handguns here. So why do you think they specified semi-automatic handguns? Well, because there's another area that they really don't want to uh, consider, or at least where they've come to a very different interpretation. And that is with respect to, for instance, the uh, Beowulf magazines. So if you're not familiar with this issue, there are uh, AR-15s chambered in 50 Beowulf. And if you have one of those magazines... They will contain, you know, if that magazine was pinned to five rounds of 50 Beowulf, it will contain more than five rounds of 223, and it'll still feed. So the RCMP has taken the view that those magazines are prohibited devices in Canada. That's their view on that. Now, this seems very difficult to reconcile with their view with respect to the handgun magazines. So it's very interesting to see how they've come to sort of two separate conclusions on that and, you know, why they have. I suspect that this is largely just a matter of their kind of interpretation, their feelings on the subject. But again, um, if you wanted to fight this in a court, it would be very expensive. Uh, if you have one of these magazines and it's, you know, pinned to five rounds of 50 Beowulf, you should expect that you are in a legally perilous area. The RCMP takes the view that you would be committing a serious criminal offense. I can't say I know for certain what a court would say, but uh, don't do it because 
A, you might be committing a crime. I can't say for certain because the law here is super unclear. And, you know, even if you're not, the expense and the stress and, you know, all of that from fighting it is, you know, it's not worth it. You would, you would very much regret your choices if the RCMP were to discover that. So, again, you know, don't do it. It's a bad idea. Just stick to, uh, stick to the sort of safer areas here. But uh, this kind of re uh, revisiting is something that is, in my view, sort of indicative of just how badly written this law is. Because really, we should get to a sort of a place where we're very clear. We have a very, you know, clear understanding of what is and is not permitted. And we're not there. We're not there by a long stretch. So I would love, I think that the best way to resolve this, quite frankly, is just to get rid of these cartridge capacity limits uh, in general. But uh, I don't know if there's the political appetite for that. It seems really... You know, it doesn't make much sense. And when we start talking about Canadian sports shooters, it puts them at a great disadvantage with respect to other jurisdictions, particularly the United States. Because, for instance, if you do three gun here in Canada and you want to be a competitive three gun shooter, you're practicing probably with five round AR-15 magazines and then going to competitions in the States where everyone else is using 30 round magazines. And, you know, they're practiced with 30 round magazines and the courses of fire expect 30 round magazines. How is that, you know, how is that a fair playing field? This greatly disadvantages, you know, Canadian sports shooters, but it doesn't actually provide any protection to the public because, you know, criminals aren't really going to worry about these maximum restrictions. It's quite common that we see, uh, cr you know, people who are charged with firearm offenses also getting charged for having the, uh, the you know, the what the RCMP calls large capacity magazines. But what are actually standard capacity magazines in almost every case? You know, usually we're not talking about things like, you know, drum magazines or anything like that. We're talking about just the magazine as it was designed for the firearm by the original manufacturer. So that's uh, that's my own personal feelings as to how to fix this law, which is to kind of relax a little. But uh, again, I'm not a politician. I don't have any power to affect any changes here. Those are just kind of my feelings. Anyway, thank you for watching. I want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Demo, Sir Daniel Wicks of Alberta, Canada's National Firearms Association, and Kyle Martin. At the $20 level, Cameron Johnson, Kevin Fleet, Dale Nesbitt, and Andrew Elsich, as well as a number of you at the $10 level who will be in the crawl immediately following. Uh, thank you once again for watching, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge.